Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're about to kick off our first round of breakout sessions. Uh, this session is breakout A3, Sustainability, Food Values, and Innovation, What Matters to Customers Now? It is my great pleasure to welcome Michael Kaufman to be our moderator of today's session. Um, Michael has been introduced on the main stage. He's a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, as well as the co-founder and partner of Positive Strategy and uh, one of the leaders of our Menus of Change Business Leadership Council. Michael, with that, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. We have three extraordinarily extraordinary panelists with expertise in three key areas, the commercial and non-commercial sectors of food service and food manufacturing. I'll briefly introduce each of them. More complete bios, as you know, are available on the Menus of Change site. I welcome your questions along the way. Please enter them into the, into the chat. We'll do our best to answer them. No doubt, though, there's a risk we'll run out of time before all of your questions can be addressed. And panelists, please feel free to have a conversation among yourselves. I'm just here to make sure that you have fun. So in alphabetical order, Megan Bloomer. Megan has served as the Vice President of Sustainability and CSR for the Cheesecake Factory since the creation of the department in 2014. In this role, Megan creates and manages the strategic and environmental stewardship endeavors for the cheese. Next up is Mike Mess. Mike is the president of Oatly North, leading all aspects of since their year 17. Oatly makes vegan plant based food and beverage products made out of oats and was rich in over 20. Mike, congratulations on your recent very successful. And thank you. Is a strategic. Advisor and specialist in sustainability and supply chain. Professor for the Food Business School at the. She spent her career questioning. Working with chefs and building trust among suppliers. To move in new directions, including at Bon Appetit at Google. So, so panel, let's start with each of you responding to the overall questions. And Helene, I'll go to you first. What matters to consumers now, Helene? What are you seeing in the non-commercial space? Um, thanks, and um, I'm I'm still in the space. I have to say, uh, but mostly I have independent uh, uh, independent clients, and and I would say that the priorities before COVID are the same priorities now, but there's just a sense of urgency, and I think there's a sense of urgency because everybody's trying to get back uh, to work and trying to figure out what that is. But uh, so there's more focus and energy, but it's still about health, personal health. It's about climate. It's about stories of food and it's about deliciousness. It's always about deliciousness. Um, you, you can't you, you can't sell anyone on anything without deliciousness. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that's getting some new traction, which brings together a lot of these issues is the idea of place based sustainability. We have had 20 years of certification programs like the Marine Stewardship Council and other sort of global efforts, which were a great starting point. But now we're seeing, we want to respect smaller producers. That's what the Farm to Fork movement was all about. And we also wanna respect producers who are doing things really well in different parts of the world. So using global criteria for sustainability, adding a layer of social and gender equity, and then and particularly in allowing those producers to figure out how to get to those ends. So uh, you know, environmental and now very much social sustainability matters a ton to our consumers, and by our consumers, I mean in our uh, in our space, obviously contract catering, but how do we um, how do we let those producers, like the women shrimp farmers of Southeast Asia, how do we let them decide how to do it right and to reach those goals? I think it's fascinating. I think it's the new local. Super interesting. We'll we'll uh, we'll get back to that in in a minute. Uh, uh, Megan, how about how about Cheesecake Factory? What what are consumers telling you, and what changes have you made in response? So 
For us, I mean, the Cheesecake Factory has always been about celebrations. And post COVID, we're seeing that even more. It's joy, it's being with family and friends, it's a sense of return, returning to quote unquote normal. So we're not seeing as much of an ask as Helene is because our clients are a little bit different. But what we're doing is embedding all of our sustainability and social justice work on the back end. So for us, you don't need as a consumer, as a guest of our restaurants to come in and ask us about our sourcing. We want you to know that we're already doing it and you can just come in and enjoy that celebration with your family and friends. But throughout COVID, while we had so many challenges, we didn't back away from or change any of our environmental or social goals. But we did have to become more creative about how you meet those goals when an entire supply chain is disrupted. Super, thanks. And Mike, uh, how about you for Oatly? What are you seeing? What matters to consumers? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, two observations and I think really kind of building upon what both of uh, the prior panelists have shared, you know, when it comes to the, the food choices, I think the intersection of, uh, you know, I think certainly for Oatly, it's always been about you know, the balance of nutritional health with environmental and sustainable uh, resource uh, efficiency, but also taste. And I think Helene mentioned that before of you, it, it really is the intersection of those. And that's a very tricky Venn diagram from a, a manufacturer standpoint to navigate of how are you balancing those, you know, balanced macronutrients with, you know, uh, sustainable sourcing coupled with at the end of the day, we're talking about food and beverage products. It needs to work. It needs to taste great. And, and I think where you're seeing the acceleration of plant-based eating uh, in the United States is where consumers can have those, um, those, those food and, and, and beverage experiences without that, that, you know, meet those sustainability uh, objectives or goals that they have that make them feel great about that choice, but they have it without compromising uh, function and performance and taste. That is where I think you're really seeing rapid paradigm shift from where we even were a few years ago. Um, when we talk to our consumers, you know, even relative to five years ago, um, you know, pre-pandemic, that uh, you know there is a growing need around you know the the urgency of climate change and and the way that weighs upon consumers and their need for you know at a loss for what governments or you know non-government organizations are going to do about it the individual thing that humans can do is shift to a more balanced plant-based diet that doesn't mean all veganism that doesn't mean all plant-based but in choices throughout their day with different menu applications and your morning coffee uh, dessert that, you know, finding ways to shift to plant-based diet during your week is an individual agency kind of contribution towards what you can do in the absence of, you know, more broad scale solutions. And that's where people go to, uh, you know, an oat milk latte or something like that, or, or small, you know, decisions in, in, in menu selection. And so, you know, we're seeing a rapid adoption and acceleration, but I think it's because consumers are more educated and it's top of mind and the availability of high quality options across food and beverage um, that are allowing them to make those choices without feeling like they're compromising on that delicious, enjoyable experience is really what is accelerating um, uh, plant-based food consumption. And Mike, so about, that, can I just oh, say something to oh, add on do, to honey, that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think there is menu development, but there's also recipe development, which is even before then. Mm -hmm. And where I'm seeing a lot of energy among chefs is how do we tweak some of these recipes so they taste like the favorites that people are familiar with? Because we're trying to attract people back into the office. Many yes. of them have options to be there for three days or four or two or whatever it is. So many of, of the clients in food service are saying, hey, come up with cool things to actually help people come back to the office. We'll promote the food so that people will, and, and you know, people are tired of making their own food. I mean, not everybody, I'm not, but a lot of people are, and I'm glad about that. My sector will, will certainly benefit from that. But the chefs are exercised about how do we change the recipes so that it tastes familiar, but we can promote it as healthier. We can also promote it as 
um, more planet friendly. So, so that's interesting, Lane. So, uh, so that's actually an additional hook to try to draw people back to the office space is to uh, create uh, interesting food options. <laughs> cool. Um, and not I'm making so, a secret of it. Yes. <laughs> And again, I want to encourage panelists, uh, I didn't mean to cut off Helene initially, but uh, to talk to one another. Um, you know, you are our experts here, so um, uh, the conversation among you is uh, would be terrific. Um, but, but I guess, Mike, for, for Oatly, um, it sounds like what is happening in the consumer space is re just really driving your um, ability to produce more and sell more as opposed to innovate more or are you innovating more along the way as well and if so what does that look like as consumers are increasingly looking for these choices yeah i mean i, I think it's it's a little bit of both michael in that you know fundamentally for Oatly, i mean we we uh have been making oat milk in sweden for 20 plus years and so that was an idea that the formula and how we do that is the same as it was in the 90s um, and so the market and consumer demand has kind of caught up, I think, in our opinion, to that idea where, you know, there, there's other pieces that we can take that core offering from and think about like, well, you know, we can, you know, introduce a plant, a great plant-based option to someone through their morning coffee or their breakfast cereal. But like, how also could we use that to make some, like a, it's a it's a real different experience having your morning latte on your way to work or you know sitting at your desk in the morning versus having a bowl of ice cream um, or you know in our case like non dairy frozen dessert as part of a, a birthday celebration uh, you know a, a, a Friday night after a long week sitting there watching a movie or your favorite reality television show like that's a moment in someone when consumers invite you in to those moments whether it's part of their daily routine of how they want to start their day. Um, or when they're like looking for those moments of like me relaxation, like recharging reward stuff. And like if, if there's uh, if there's a plant based option that still satisfies that like deliciousness treat action, like they're feeling better about it. And that isn't all just about fat and calories. That's about making a choice that they feel good about. Right. And so nutrition is a component, but planetary health. Um, and environmental health is an equal component in there because people at the end of the day don't want when you've had a really lousy week and I mean we've had plenty of those in the past 15 months right like you want to have that reward moment and you're not going to compromise on on the way that that needs to taste for you and so for Oatly yeah I mean we have seen even since we started in the United States four years ago more and more people, I think 60% of all of our consumers have only tried our product in the last 12 months. So it's accelerating um, with, with people just, you know, this inertia around people thinking differently about food and thinking differently about those choices. But also we can apply that and, and you know, Oatly and many, many other great, great companies are thinking about how can we create offerings that meet different needs through the day and people's week, whether it's, you know, in the commercial dining sector at offices and when they're out to celebrate a great event with their family or they're just at home, uh, you know, uh, watching Real Housewives and, and trying to get through the week. <laughs> that's for me. I mean, that's what I do. So, uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of celebrate. Megan, um, understanding, understanding that when to mark okay, the point of view about what they it certainly um, um, led the way for both celebration uh, and opulence both in its design, design and in the portion sizes etc so as you navigate this does and given your your position is especially does does cheesecake kind of lead the consumer or consumer lead cheesecake how do you balance those two and, and taking into account what Mike and Helene have talked about, which is that there is this growing consumer thought about um, what might be better for me and for the planet. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's a great question. I think it's both. So what a lot of folks may not know about the Cheesecake Factory is that we do a menu redesign every six months. So two or three, maybe six things come off our menu and six or plus things get added to our menu. It's all based on what the global trend is and what we're seeing and what our guests are asking us for. 
And we track that via sales, just like any of our competitors would. What's been really amazing is that because we create every single dish we serve from scratch in that kitchen every day, to Helene's point, you can customize it. And so as we start to see customizations come through, we can adapt. So we were actually able to put a vegan cob salad on our menu really quickly because we already had all of those fresh ingredients. Then as we saw that amazing, delicious vegan cob sell, we said, okay, let's play with this a little more. What else can we do? We've had a, a vegetarian black bean burger on our menu for years. We said, can we make that vegan? What do we need to bring in house? We brought in house vegan mayonnaise, uh, vegan salad dressings, made sure with a really comprehensive audit to make sure that our buns were vegan, all of those sort of things. And that evolution continues all the way through putting an impossible burger on our menu, taking the impossible and, and adapting that into impossible bolognese and impossible tacos. Like we have always been for our 40 year history, a place that serves everyone. And that's a huge ask. Bring a group of eight family members together and ask them what they want to eat and you're going to get eight different restaurant types. The fact that all eight of you can come to the Cheesecake Factory and find something that you like, as well as something that now fits your dietary preferences or perhaps dietary mandates based on health conditions, that's a really impressive thing for a company to do. Now, to that point, that also means our menus are incredibly complex because at any given point we have to be able to adapt and make that dish you want vegetarian or vegan within you know within certain limitations but i think what the consumer wants is to be able to pick and if that means that i as a non-vegan can go eat with my vegan friends and we both have an incredible dining experience and to both mike and helene's point it's delicious and we want to go back that's what the Cheesecake Factory is about. Our mission is absolute guest satisfaction. There's no margin for error in absolute. So we take that into account both on what's on our menu and what goes into the dishes that ultimately end up at your table. Super. My I mean, I would just add on, on that one, Mike. I mean, I, I love the way Megan describes that. And I think that like, there's something to be said, you know, when you're thinking about trying to change food systems towards more plant-based options that, market-driven solutions, customer-driven solutions, where that's the pull driving the behavior that they're seeing. There is no, I mean, as much as, like, there's no scientific studies, you know, op-eds that we can write that are going to uh, kind of change consciousness without the actual consumer demand of, of trying plant-based foods, whether it's a, a Cobb salad, a burger, a latte, and feeling like not only is it good, but maybe they like it better, right? And, and that is the market demand that then flows into, you know, for private com you know, companies like Oatly, you know, innovating, you know, investment flowing into the agricultural space on sourcing that, you know, it cannot be, you know, there's got to be a balance here of push pull. But I think what Megan's describing there of like that demand driven solutions that create the action around guest satisfaction, you know, that's that motivation, you know, moves and and I think we're in the middle of that at an accelerated rate. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would add to that that we are in such a special position today versus five years ago. I mean, literally this morning, I was working with nutritionists and uh, uh, some others uh, procurement people to analyze different milk alternatives from all kinds of nutritional perspectives and climate and other environmental criteria. And we've done the same on uh, meat analogs, where five years ago, we were talking about our own in-house beef um, burgers, or possibly a um, uh, burger made with mushrooms, because the Mushroom Council certainly was, and the Lentil Council were out there a lot before a lot of the big companies of consumers, to Mike's point, saying, I want this kind of milk. I want that kind of milk. No, I want this kind of milk. And the question for us always is, how do we balance? How do we lead the consumer? Because we carry them all. We're not a supermarket. We don't want, because that's our biggest for climate action is to radically reduce waste. So how do we satisfy the consumer um, buy what they need, and then make sure, of course, that the chef has 
uh, the leftovers to make something delicious back at the house with the product so it doesn't go to waste. But I think it, these are challenges we didn't have five years ago, and that's a special place to be. I think, you know, the other thing is that as a restaurant company, as a guest facing restaurant entity, food service entity, I get to sit in this really amazing apex of ideation because every new Oatly mm -hmm. that comes to the market, because of the way our restaurants work with being from scratch, we can then say, okay, we have 18 recipes. Let's try this. Which ones does it change the flavor profile? Which one does it enhance the flavor profile? Right. And then we may be able to add it as an option. Do you want your cappuccino with milk or do you want it with Oatly? And it, it's this really great place where we are able to say, we can do this. We can give you multiple mm -hmm. options yeah. and, and how you want to mix and match and make your perfect choose your own adventure is up to you. And then on the back end, we're able to see what are those sales? What are comments that we're getting? Where can we improve this? And at some point in many of the situations, we'll just say, okay, we're going to pull Oatly over to this. And we may not ever market it that way, but we think it's a better product. We think it gives us a better flavor profile in the dish. For us, it's just how do we continue to evolve? How do we continue to get better? And what decisions can we make to be a more sustainable company that also aren't dependent on the guest dollar, right? Mm. So whether or not you came in and ordered a uh, vegan black bean burger or a chicken Madeira or a hibachi steak, we are sourcing those products, those proteins and those plant-based proteins in the most sustainable way that we can feasibly do at this point. We, you know, we're very public about how we source. You can go to the website, download a report. We'll show you what percentage of each protein category is currently meeting our guidelines where we have challenges. We're very transparent about where we have challenges, how we're trying to work with other folks to move the needle forward on that. At the end of the day, the Cheesecake Factory is not a vegan or vegetarian restaurant as a concept, but it doesn't mean it can't serve that market. And I think the more products like Oatly, those kind of consumer packaged good products that we can bring in as an ingredient come to market, the more options you'll see on restaurant menus. And so, Megan, just to follow up on that, it, you know, a number of years ago, the, the idea was it was sort of stealth health. That is, don't tell the consumer what you're doing. Just do it and uh, and hope they don't notice and, and then we'll accept it. And maybe at the back end, you might say, oh, by the way, we added more whole grains or whatever. Are, are you suggesting we're beyond that? We can be we can be more transparent or is it a combination of the two? I think we're beyond that in terms of calories fat content. I mean, I'm also saying that as a restaurant company that has an entire menu that's called Skinny Licious. I think it's got about 40 dishes on it that are under 600-ish calories. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but I mean, we, ha we have a menu that if you're coming to dine with us and you're health oriented, we're going to serve that. We have a vegetarian or vegan, however you choose to order it, black bean burger. We also have an Impossible Burger. Those are two different markets for us. We find that most folks that eat Impossible are not vegan vegetarian. They are someone who is traditionally eating red meat and wants to cut a little bit of it out. Or they're someone who's never had the Impossible Burger and just wants to try it, right? Those, so it's important, the diversity of the menu continues to be really important. But what I think you're actually seeing now is a trend to transparency, but not in a way to win market share. Like the self-health was, oh, you know, like we're going to make it healthier for you. That's not our mission. If you want to dine based on a health criteria, great. We'll give you the information you need. If you want to dine based on how many cheesecakes you can taste in one setting, great. We'll bring them all out to your table. Like as a company who is known for indulgence, that's not ever going to be our mission. But again, it goes back to that same point. You don't have to know about animal welfare standards and global shipping logistics to order my shrimp, bistro shrimp, right? Like we're already buying at BAP four star. We are already understanding how to maximize our freight footprint. We're already trying to buy seasonal and local to reduce uh, trucking emissions. We're gonna do that. I just want you to enjoy your shrimp dish or your chicken dish or your plant-based dish, whatever it is. Yeah. For us, it's about taking some of the complications out of it um, and regardless of if you were, if I, if I put two salads on the menu and one was organic and one isn't, I'm letting the consumer dictate how I'm buying. Instead, what we did is say for all of our salads, we're going to remove all of these pesticides from our supply chain. And again, we're publicly talking to you about that. We'll tell you where we stand towards that goal. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to choose between organic or inorganic. 
we're making the choice in the back of the house. You're just choosing between chicken Asian salad and a Cobb salad, right? And that's where I, I think the market is actually going to go because I think the, the market for non-sustainable food is just disappearing. It's not even a choice at this point. It is, if you want to stay in business, this is the new way that restaurants operate. And, and mm. that's exciting. And Helene, do you see that as well in, uh, in the work that you've done and the advice that you're, uh, the folks that you're advising, are they accepting that as, because after all, at least in many of the non-commercial um, situations, it's an indirect, you know, you're not directly working with a consumer, you're working with those who in turn, whether it's their employees, right. their students, et cetera, uh, right. their clients. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that, although certainly there are a lot of clients in different parts of the country, different parts of the world that have uh, different profiles. But I, I agree with Megan. I think, uh, you know, the time is changing. And to answer your original question, Michael, or the question you posed to Megan, is that we have consumers who are demanding this information and demanding these products. So while we used to talk about stealth health and I've been involved in a lot of those efforts. Um, right now, we're kind of wearing it on our sleeve because we have people who would actually be turned off by our not promoting it as an option. Um, I will say, though, that still the most important thing is how delicious do I think it's going to be? And of course, for consumers, uh, many of them are very concerned about the price, and that in our sector certainly goes to the subsidy or whatever um and it's how you name the product so we might not just give a clue about uh you know environmental sustainability or um or, or some other attribute but we're going to talk about how delicious it is we're going to name sauces you know, they're going to put that front and center and we're going to make special uh, attention to give products names that are enticing um, that are about the flavor, not about the item itself. So I, I, I think I think you bridge it that way. But if you look at what college students are eating today versus 10 years ago versus 20 years ago, and how college menus have changed, that tells you how corporate menus are going to change. And then independent restaurants are changing to reflect that as well. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm sorry. I would just add on to, to that with, with what Helene said. I mean, it's not a shock or incredibly insightful to say that the access that consumers have to information about their health, their food, is never been higher than where it is now. That flows into the choices they make. And then whether you're, you know, a, a restaurant like what Megan described or a manufacturer like us with Oatly, like there's, it, it is about, you know, the, having the transparency and information to be able to share, to back up that trust that you're trying to build and meet them where they are. Where again, if it's just like, I want something that tastes great, or I'm a full, you know, 24 seven vegan for so many, you know, ethical reasons, like you want to be able to meet people where they are. And I, so I think that piece on uh, information and transparency for companies to raise the bar for, you know, you know, distributors, restaurateurs, you know, manufacturers to be able to have that information about the why behind their products. So, you know, where we, you know, uh, we have for years in, in Europe and in Sweden published a sustainability report about all the activities that we do. We put it on the website. We talk about the things that we're really proud of that we do. We also talk about the areas we need to improve. Um, that level of transparency and in some cases humility is really important about building trust and credibility with partners and consumers where they do what all of us do when we have a question. They pick up their phone and they just Google you and they figure it out like they're going to they're going to find the answer in a few minutes. And if you're trying to live in a world of 20 years ago where you thought you could uh, keep that part a secret, like it's not going to happen. And so um, that trust has a reinforcing effect that that inspires more, you know, loyalty, both for a, a food provider as well as manufacturers. Um, and so that that that's really important that we you know use the science, use the data as an underlying piece to inspire that consumption and, and transparency. You know, I just want to quickly add on onto that, Michael, if I can. There, please. So can just there's also a question in the chat about how do you track sustainability factors in purchasing? And it very much goes to, to Mike's comment. 
it's about trust. And so I, as a brand, have a lot of trust from my guests. Well, how do I earn that trust? I earn it through credibility, through continually delivering a great product. It's hard. It is hard to do this work. So, I mean, we're sending out data requests to over 2,000 suppliers on a quarterly basis and then tracking not only what they're reporting, but tracking that, like, did you send me the exact same copy paste data as last time I asked you this? And if so, you're getting flagged and then you're going to have an on-site follow-up and then you're going to have an audit. But like, <laughs> I really just want to sit here and tell you that you should come eat at my restaurants because we buy great. But that doesn't work that way. It used yeah. to. That used to be, I mean, that's the whole greenwashing movement that we saw a decade ago. But now I have to go back to Mike and say, okay, Mike, show me that you've actually reduced that's right. your footprint by 15%. Show me that you've reduced your water. Then I can say, okay, I feel comfortable putting Oatly on my menu. This and if we, if we as a supplier are going to make, I mean, in Europe and, you know, we put the unique carbon footprint of a carton of oat milk on the front of the packaging. People are trained to look at, you know, what are the numbers you use when you buy something? How much, do, what's the price? What's the calories, the fat content, the protein? But there's another number that's equally important that people need to know about, which is what it took to make this product. And, and it doesn't matter if you can compare it, it provokes the thought, right? And we use, we use you know, peer reviewed life cycle assessments of our manufacturing footprint because it's not just enough. I mean, I, I completely agree with Megan that if we're going to do business with her and, and, and do these things, uh, you know, it's incumbent upon me to be able to give that data with integrity um, that could be reviewed. And it doesn't mean everybody has to agree with it, but like we want to be able to show those things because that, you know, forget any, I don't, if people don't drip, drink a drop of oat milk. Like, but it advances the standard and the, the depth of the dialogue and conversation, which actually creates real change in the food and because it raises the bar for everybody with choices that, you know, distributors make, you know, restaurants make, food, food companies make, like that's important. Like that, and that's happening at an accelerated rate in the market today. You know, we, we, ended last, we, we ended last year's menu of change with a panel called uh, Why Trust Science? And the question, you know, that we debated was, you know, how does that work? And obviously, having gone through the pandemic where there's been a huge amount of consumer um, or citizen skepticism about different things that have been um, put forward. And, and, and so if we look at Megan and Mike and Helene, how you are thinking about this, um, the, the credibility and trust of the brand, the brand, the credibility and trust of the science behind the claim and the brand um, becomes critical. Um, and how have you balanced that? And, you know, are there segments of your consumers, respective consumers that look at this and say, you know, fine, I'm not that interested in this and therefore I'm, I'm uh, moving on and I'm skeptical about uh, the claims uh, that you're making around X, Y, or Z, even in the chat. Sure. We've seen some uh, sure. potential controversy around, uh, you know, what is or is not appropriate here. So I'd be interested in, in any of your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, I, I'm good. I'll, Go ahead, I'll just wear my, my teaching hat. You know, I, I teach emerging entrepreneurs at the Food Business School of the CIA um, who are about to launch businesses. And we talk a lot about that and why it's important and how to know if a uh, credible or not. And it, it goes, uh, you know, Megan, I loved hearing what you were saying because um, actually both of you, I mean, the transparency is important um, and the accountability is very important. I actually use Oatly, Oatly uh, LC, um, in as a, as a teaching material. And, uh, you know, uh, students ask me this question a lot, which is, you know, I, I don't have enough time to do all of that. I don't have um, enough resources to do all of that. And it's about building the networks of trust. It's about you know, when you're small, you don't want to just use uh, phrases that others are using. You want to have your core ingredients. You want to visit your suppliers. You want to understand the mechanisms that you can use, that they can use to actually um, uh, demonstrate uh, authenticity, demonstrate credibility, demonstrate environmental and social responsibility. But let's face it, there are not that many tools out there that are very well developed at this time. And um, certainly emerging businesses don't have a lot of resources yet. 
There are some being developed. I'm excited about them. If you were to ask me this question a year from now, I might be able to tell you two of them. Um, but I do think that there are more and more resources because there's demand. Because whether you're a product manufacturer or you're representing a restaurant company, you need to be able to respond to customers who say, well, you know, prove to me that this is correct, that you're really trying and you're not just blowing smoke. And that is, that is some, a burden we all have, a burden, but it's one that fortunately more and more tools are becoming available. And um, we have to be transparent about what we can't do. I love that idea because that does not only uh, show more about trust and authenticity, but it gives you gives our customers a way to see the path that we're on. That's right. Perhaps and and I, I, well, I'm sorry, just to build on that quickly yeah. is, I, I mean, I agree on the availability and advancement of these tools. Cause I mean, it, I mean, I, we've been at Oli for four and a half years in the United States. There were three of us when we started, like it wasn't easy to build an LCA for the United States. We did it. We, and we're, and now we're updating it. And, and like, it doesn't get easier if more companies don't do it right. Like the interest, the activity, the, the, the more companies and, and investment and the scrutiny draws the resources and the advancement to make it more um, a, a higher degree of proliferation of these tools in the market make it easier for companies and brands and restaurants starting out. I mean, we want, I mean, I would love a day where a restaurant, a coffee shop is able to use commonly available tools at low investment levels to analyze their menu of like, what is the environmental footprint of these choices that I've made to serve to consumers? Like, I think we're in reach of that in the coming years, for sure. It's not there today in an easy fashion, um, but you need to be able to plow that field so that you can, you can advance that mission forward. And for us, you know, it's, we're fully, come, there's all sorts of reasons why people might choose to use our product or not. Like, you know, <laughs> vegan, vegan consumption lifestyle, you know, lactose intolerance and allergens, uh, you know, environmental sensitivity, or just like the taste or you don't like those things, and that's also good. Um, we're, we're fine with it. We just wanna represent why we are making the product we are and that why resonates with people and to back it up with data and to say, here's our sustainability report. Let's talk to you about the results. They're slightly worse than last year. Uh, here's what we're gonna do to improve those. Then people know that you're not just out there shilling on this thing and trying to sell. Like we're trying to create change and impact with that. And I think that's really important. I'm sorry, Megan, I interrupted you before. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we saw when we first started on this journey eight years ago was everyone was just defaulting to certifications. And so we said, okay, let's lean in and learn about these certifications. And then you saw so much corruption, so much pay to play, so much, you know, just deceit of if you could have two separate certifications, and this was very prevalent in, in Southeast Asia and seafood, you could be certified by both bodies and say, okay, I'm producing a thousand metric tons and both bodies certify a thousand metric tons, but yet you're not producing 2000 metric tons, but you have a thousand, you have a certificate to sell a thousand metric tons under each certification. Things like that, that we didn't even know existed until we, until we really started to dig in. So we went through a prescriptive approach. We said, okay, what pieces of each one of these certifications do we like? And then we saw that there wasn't really a labor or a social standard to many of the certifications. Okay, we're, we're gonna, who's best in class at this? And we'll pull over what they're doing. And, you know, we brought a lot of work in, in house because of that, but we're now at a place where we have accolades for the transparency, not for the progress, for the transparency in our reporting. So if you go to our 2020 CSR report, which just got published in May and scroll to the appendices, you're gonna see a red circle. And that circle means I missed a goal. We didn't achieve gestation crate free pork in 2020. Now, there's a lot of reasons that we didn't. And if you wanna have a call, we'll jump on a call and we'll go through those. But what's frustrating to me is we saw many other players in the food service and industry space when they saw they weren't gonna meet that goal, suddenly their publicly stated goals went from gestation crate free to group housing. Those are two very different things. And they did that very slyly and we said no we're not going to do that that is not what we said we said gestation crate free we defined what that was we're sticking to it so yes we missed a goal but here's why and i think that's what builds you know to mike's point that's what builds that integrity 
And then not just here's why, but here's what we're doing. We're switching vendors. We're going after this. We refuse to acknowledge that some people think less than 45 days in a gestation crate should be gestation crate free. For us, it's zero, none, never. We're sticking by that. We're not going to meet this goal in the timeline we said, but I guarantee you we are going to meet it and we're going to be very truthful and transparent through that process. Well, speaking speaking of timeline, I see uh, Shara is uh, here and I think that means uh, we got to move on. Um, unless she just was enjoying the conversation and wanted to contribute. <laughs> no, uh, I, I was enjoying the conversation. I've been in the background this entire time and thank you so much to our incredible panel. This conversation obviously um, could go on for much longer than the, the, the 40 minutes we had today, but um, the incredible insights and passion that you each brought um, were so valuable. And I, I wanna thank you so much for, for spending a little time with us today um, and sharing your insights. So. Thank you all so much. You're gonna hang on for a moment because I'm gonna give everyone a little detail on where we're heading next, and then we'll ask each of you for your, your final top takeaway note. Um, I also wanna thank Oatly for their support of Menus of Change and this session. Uh, so now all of our uh, attendees will be headed into a networking time, which is sponsored by Kellogg's Away From Home. In sessions, we have three meet the author areas. Um, Kevin Mitchell, Sophie Egan, and Eve Tarot paul will all be available for meet the author, author conversations. In networking, we have the four minute one-to-one -one video chats. And today's topic is what is your primary sustainability priority for 2021? And then we have the Innovation Hub, where we have uh, culinary demos, insightful presentations, and plant forward innovation um, from our generous sponsors. So please take a moment to visit all of these areas um, throughout all the networking times over the next few days. Um, after our networking time, we're going to go live back on the main stage at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern today for the next general session, uh, which is focused on strategies and innovation for rebuilding. Uh, so before we depart, I'm going to hand it back to Michael for a quick top takeaway from each uh, panelist. Well, um, uh, you don't need me; you need the panelists. So let's go quickly around. Uh, Megan, what's your top? Uh, what's your top line? Uh, I think the top line is continue to ask the tough questions, whether that's inside a company, of someone you buy from, of someone you work with, because that's what drives change. Terrific, thank you, Aline. What's yours? Uh, I think whether uh, group housing or uh, gest gestation crate free housing has been a topic for a long time uh, and it's taken decades to uh, really get there. I think social justice issues, which we didn't have a chance to talk about, place-based sustainability, really sort of bringing in those social equity issues are the next 20 year um, uh, set of goals that we need to address. I appreciate that, Helene. And Mike, you got the last word. Wow, that is, uh, wow, this was very, very great. I appreciate all my panelists, fellow panelists on this. I, you know, I would say that as, as much transformation as anyone thinks that they've seen in terms of plant-based foods and supply chain, we are, it is not even reached the, you know, the, the kind of full inflection point on this, the alignment between uh, manufacturers, um, you know, distributors, providers, restaurants, the industry, and, and then that consumer driven pull is going to see acceleration in this in the coming years that makes even the past five years, past 12, 24 months, pale in comparison when you talk about great options, transparency, data, um, and, and integrity. And so it's, a, it's, it's an ex incredibly exciting space to be in and the power that um, the culinary world has in this to shape the future of food systems cannot be under underset, and it's 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 the best. It's the, what other what other job, what other industry would you want to be in? It's it's uh, it, it's it's just the best. So well, I hope I hope for those who are viewing this uh, take that to heart because we need to do a lot of hard work, and I uh, hope we have inspired some to go and tackle some uh, some big issues. So Helene, Mike, and Megan, thank you so much for your participation today and wonderful insights and share it back to you. Thank you so much, Michael, for hosting the conversation. Uh, everyone enjoy some networking and we will see you back on the main stage uh, shortly. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.